Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. Real everybody, I'm Pete Wright. That there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey! And we spoil movies tonight on the show. It's time for a bedtime story with Sergio in Once Upon a Time in the West. The railroad, the boom towns. A new life and the promised land. Once upon a time. The widow, the land grabber, the outlaw, the gunman. The man in search of a name. Andy, this was an interesting experience watching this movie. <laughs> Tell the people why it was, Pete. Well, uh, it it you know it's not a it's not a short movie, and I think it took me about forty five minutes 
of watching it to to realize that in fact I've never seen it once upon a time in the West. <laughs> 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 this was after being convinced you had. Yes, I did. I was totally convinced. In fact, I was convinced that I've seen all three of them. And after I realized this sort of 45 minute, like expecting things to happen in this movie that clearly were not happening, uh, I, I went and looked at the next one. Turns out I haven't seen the next one there. The only one that I've seen is the third one that we're going to be talking about in this new fancy new series that we're doing uh, that kicks off with this film. 1968's uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. And let me tell you, Andrew, I had a rollicking good time with this film. Rollicking. I like that. Rollicking good time. That is that is a, a, a fun thing to have. I was tempted to come on and just be, and just, you know, not have liked it. Like that was just going to be the thing and just see how you reacted <laughs> and see if we could do a 2001 oh, Redux. Once Upon a Time not. in 2001. <laughs> And just see how you handled it. I'm not sure you would have made it through the show. <laughs> I would not have. I would have spontaneously combusted. So because I had never seen this movie and and have been furiously trying to get up to speed on it uh, as a completely new film to my catalog, uh, I'm hoping that you might be able to set the stage. Uh, why why this, uh, this film in this series? When we were looking at the films of 1968, as uh, as listeners know, we are celebrating uh, films and series that are uh, celebrating their 50th anniversaries. And Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West uh, came out in 1968, and it birthed his Once Upon a Time trilogy, which is kind of a loose trilogy of films that he made that uh, kind of look at, uh, I guess you could say, kind of the birth of America and... And uh, this kind of this the death of the old west and and the the rise of modern society. So it's a pretty interesting um, point in time for Leone, especially because he was kind of done with westerns. He felt that he had made an epic already with the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he didn't really have anything else to say. And what he really wanted to do was make Once Upon a Time in America. But he he um, he I think he went to one of the studios and they said, you know, you can only do it. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a three picture deal. But the first thing you have to do is make a Western. And so he kind of went into this like, oh, I don't want to do this. And I, I think that with some uh, friends of his, Bernardo Bertolucci and Dario Argento, um, they, uh, he kind of tapped into them to kind of, you know, they looked at a whole bunch of all their favorite Westerns trying to come up with a story that really referenced the old West. And I, I think that's kind of the direction that they opted to go with this one. And, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure if it particularly ties into 1968 specifically, um, at least as far as Leone is concerned, I think that he, um, to some extent, uh, he saw what a lot of other, uh, filmmakers who had seen his uh, his previous trilogy and the great um, the way that he kind of gave rebirth to the uh, the western and all of a sudden he had, there were a lot of uh, spaghetti westerns being made and a lot of those were taking um, stuff that was going on in Italian politics and European politics and kind of incorporating those elements into the stories. And Leone never really was a fan of that. And uh, he kind of wanted to let the story be its own thing. And so I think it's hard to say that he was really trying to make a reflection of the times and stuff like that. But in the end, I feel like, and we've talked about this when we were talking about some of our other films in this series, in this uh, kind of this 1968 overarching series that we're doing, sometimes those things still sneak into the stories. And I do think that some of that happened here with this film. I, I found this wonderful little essay by uh, Dan Inov, and I want to read just a couple of passages because I think Dan says this says what I want to say about the movie much uh, more articulately. First, an example. Uh, he says, in one scene transition, the smoke from Frank's freshly fired gun turns into the smoke billowing from atop a train, a visual metaphor used by the famously Marxist Leone to suggest that unbridled capitalist greed is tantamount to murder. Uh, that's 
all over the place in this movie. I mean, those sorts of visual messages. And this is such a deeply visual movie that, um, you know, to say that he didn't have that he and his buddies, right, coming up with this story, Bertolucci and and um, Argento, Argento. Did, didn't have that in the back of their minds is it, it deeply short sells kind of what was going on at the time, the anxiety of 1968. But Einav goes on to say, uh, Leone may have foreseen the end of the appeal of the Western, but 50 years on, once upon a time in the West still feels relevant. Maybe that's because the world hasn't really moved on from where it was in 1968. Despite obvious technological advancements, we're still in an age where we're trying to enact real social progress and break down outdated practices, policies, and beliefs. Watching Leone's film today galvanizes our belief that we're on the cusp of change, but it also reminds us that we've been here for half a century. And and that, I think, is is what makes this film in particular so resonant for me in, in our kind of celebration of films that are are celebrating their own 50 years, um, you know, in this half year series that we we've, we've done here. It is uh, it is amazing. Uh, it is amazing in its way that it it denounces modernization, it denounces capitalism, but you know it doesn't make the old guard look all that great either. Uh, it's an old guard that is confused. It's an old guard that is uh, just sort of ponderous as to what they what they're letting go of. Well, and there's a sense that they kind of acknowledge that it's no longer their time, and we've seen that in films before, and certainly sure. in films that we've discussed on this show, where it's not really you know they've kind of outlived their their period and. We see some fantastic characters with Harmonica and Cheyenne mm-hmm. and even Frank, I would say, uh, you know, at odds a little bit with this whole idea of this this train and the modernization of the Old West, which is where they live. They live in that chaos of the Old West, and that's kind of a part of the core of their being. And as this whole thing is changing and as Morton's train is is finally getting its chance to chug along past Sweetwater and on its way to the Pacific, we know living here in the modern age that pretty soon it's, you know, the old West is going to die. You're going to see all the fences pop up and everybody's going to take the land. And pretty soon we're living in a modern society and these cowboys no longer are going to fit in. And you definitely feel that a little bit, especially as we get to the end. None of these guys. Well, I mean, Frank gets killed and he dies. I I love how even though he's this this horrible human being, he still has kind of that honor of the Old West duel. And they they go through the ritual of that whole thing. But then once he's dead, you still have uh, Cheyenne and Harmonica basically kind of you know neither of them granted cheyenne's you know getting ready to die but neither of them are in a place where they're going to settle down with jill and Mm -hmm. make a home and and step into the modern world they both are going to go off on their horses off into the sunset and this movie uh riding off into the sunset is not an act of heroism right it's an act of of sort of purposelessness rudderlessness right it's an act of just sort of leaves us all kind of puzzled what what is left for these guys right and that is a really interesting that's like a a breaking bad level of of turning on our our sort of cultural uh symbols where or, you know or, or flipping our cultural symbols right what we used to think is this image of the hero winning the west and riding off to battle another day is now completely subverted thanks to the the narrative of this film it's it, it they have taken and sullied a symbol uh in the act of of demonstrating, you know, an, an ideological perspective that is fundamentally dark. It's a it's a really interesting uh, shift for Leone. It feels like from what we saw in the last trilogy that we talked about, the Man with No Name trilogy, moving into this film and certainly the next two films, it feels like a filmmaker who has um, shifted a little bit of his uh, perspective. And this film certainly feels like a lot of the turning point. I feel like there's still some of just kind of that fun and the casualness that you had in those previous films that, you know, just people are doing things just because it's fun and it works well in context of the film. But all of a sudden now there's a little more purposefulness to things that these decisions that are getting made. And we're going to see that more and more as Leone, I think, evolves and and starts telling stories with a little more punch in this trilogy. It's going to be a really interesting series to explore. It's a it's a much more mature series. 
uh, or, or much certainly a much more mature film when you compare it to the the earlier trilogy, which I, I we both quite enjoyed, right? I mean, overall, oh, they're, they're yeah, absolutely films. love them. Yeah. Um, but this film feels like a, you know it's a it's a mature version of the stories that that they were playing at, um, you know, with those other other three films, and I think that may, that has made it. A, a much more interesting experience to watch. Uh, you know, the the homage to this film really allows us to to look at this uh, as uh, a, a love letter from Leone to all of the westerns that he so deeply appreciated. Right? Yeah. I mean, this is uh, a film that I mean, as I said, you know, he sat down with Bertolucci and Argento, and they just watched all of their favorite westerns, trying to come up with a new story that they could tell that Leone was excited about. And when they hit on this story, uh, it absolutely was the right one. Um, but it also gave Leone a chance to fill it with references to just every possible movie that he loved, all of the great Westerns. You know, you have hints of the searchers in here and you have uh, uh, the Iron Horse and um, and, and High, Noon. High Noon and Shane. Shane and yeah. there are so many uh, Westerns just all through here. Johnny Guitar. It's it's just every little corner of this film is a reference and what's great about that is this has become one of those films that is that modern filmmakers they are now referencing in their own movies so it's it's this big cyclical thing that is happening here you know like i mean sam raimi's the quick and the dead is a really obvious one and then of course tarantino the way that he plays with his sound design during the the final duel in in kill bill volume one um, you've got that fantastic sound design, which feels like he pulled that straight from the sound design in the first uh, 10 minutes of this film with a squeaky windmill. Well, I, totally. Uh, wow. I, that's a that's a great pick. And you know what's interesting? Just as those films uh, still in their use of of uh, homage of this one uh, doesn't feel like a ripoff. At no point do all of these fantastic references that are littered throughout Once Upon a Time feel uh in any way like they're ripping off uh something else it really does feel like this film is made to honor uh all of the work that has come before it and i i i just love it for that reason and that's one of the big reasons he really wanted to film in monument valley he knew that that was a key part of the iconic John Ford Western. I mean, John Ford, we talked about stagecoach on this show before he filmed so many of his films um, in that location. It's just a fantastically beautiful uh, little spot of the world that everybody should go check out at some point. And he really wanted to film there. And he did. This was his chance. And he uses it in just a beautiful, beautiful way where it's this great place for uh, this journey to the homestead and 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 kind of this little area where Sweetwater is. It's just it's just a, a wonderful wonderful way to also tie into the history of the western. And it's a fascinating uh, film because we get a, a long and wonderful and sort of rich and not to my eye abused uh, a character, a female character, a very strong female lead. Leone had really, um, I, I, I feel like his female characters had pretty much been pretty weak in his other films. It was never about the female characters. They were, as, as, uh, I think some of his biographers have said, it was always the, the, the mother or the whore, you know, it's yeah. kind of those, those, the virgin of the whore <laughs> separation between the two. And that was kind of the way that, that his female characters were portrayed. And he'll, here you certainly get, uh, Jill. As a blending of the two. I know. I was just going to say she's a mother. Or she's coming to take on the role of a mother. And she's also a sort of retired right. prostitute. Right. But but done in a way where she actually has some some heft to her character. And I felt like they wrote her in a way that's actually pretty interesting. And I really found her story incredibly compelling. This woman who's looking for a change in her life and marries this man to go move to the middle of nowhere and live with him and raise his kids. And kind of give up the life of the prostitute that she had had and um, getting there only to find out that the the man and the kids are all dead. And here she is left with this property. And instead of selling it, which she does try to do, she ends up taking on the role of um, of the the woman who's going to kind of take care of the workers to kind of help them through and really takes on this 
this role of the station master. And I found it a wonderful character. And I just, I really fall in love with Jill every time I watch this film and just the way that she interacts with everybody. I feel there's, there's a strength that works really well for her character, especially as a character of this era, you know, of the, of the old West. You know, it's interesting too. I mean, it's, it, it's tricky the way she is sort of, uh, introduced in the, in the film, you know, after that long, uh, ride across Monument Valley in the wagon, she gets to this little tavern and, and, and this tavern scene, this tavern sequence is, uh, it, it is a beautiful example of uh, blocking and uh, camera and Leone's just general eye uh, for scene. Uh, and it also is the place that we bring together uh, three, our three really prominent characters. Her, obviously, she's the one who lands there. And then, uh, you know, she meets Cheyenne and uh, we bring Cheyenne and Harmonica together in this in this fantastic sequence and speaking specifically of her you could walk out of this scene and think that she's just another leone kind of uh whelp of a of a character right she's largely ignored apart by these other two uh a- apart from the camera paying dutiful attention to her uh she's she's largely ignored by these guys and 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 you could have the sense that she's going to be ultimately useless over the next two hours and so i i love the way that that he sort of stitches her into this and and uh and, and how we actually get to see her start to shine as as she's as she reaches the the mcbain home and, and discovers you know what her life is is really going to be now yeah two of my favorite moments in the film are when she um first gets to Sweetwater and she's kind of um, after she's looked around and everything, she lays down in the bed and there's this great shot from overhead looking down at her through kind of the lace of the, um, uh, of the canopy of the bed. And it just kind of pushes in on her face as she's laying there. And it's just this beautiful portrait of this woman who's just kind of, I mean, you know, she never really even knew this man. I mean, she knew him, you know, they married in secret down in New Orleans before she came up, but it wasn't like a love or anything. And, and she gets here and everyone's dead and it's just, everything is thrown, um, kind of to the wind. And here she is just kind of laying there lost. And I just love that look on her face. And the other moment that really gets me is when she's making the decision that she's leaving and, you know, she's packed everything up. And there's this, there's this, she puts the rifle back on the wall and she looks in the mirror and I swear, Leone is one of the most patient filmmakers. I swear she just is like looking, uh, kind of lost in her thoughts for, it feels like a minute of just staring before she kind of catches herself and, and kind of gets herself ready and picks up her bag to leave. And that's when she opens the door to reveal that Cheyenne is there. Um, just those moments of her as she's just thinking and, and kind of analyzing all this i just find really powerful the way that he presents it i do too and and with every sort of passing block every passing scene she becomes uh more resonant in the the arc of the film and she's just really well used that was a that was a great surprise yeah you want to talk a little bit more about getting it uh, about how this thing came together uh before we dig into leone's direction here this was, well, as I said, it was one of those ones where he didn't want to do it. But when they finally kind of he and these other uh, buddies of his kind of put together this idea, it kind of uh, they kind of hit on something and it really started developing it. And I think a big chunk of that was that um, uh, the Paramount came on board to do the financing for these uh, for this three uh, set of three films. And with that, they gave him access to Henry Fonda and they gave him a pretty decent budget. And so he's like, oh, OK, that's actually it sounds pretty good. Um, and uh, of course, as, as I mentioned, the opportunity to go film part of it at Monument Valley. And so all of those things were things that worked really well for him. And uh, to, and when he kind of all that stuff hit, he's just like, you know, it's it's hard to turn it down. And so he, of course, came on board to do it. And, uh, yeah, they, they, I mean, that was back in, I think it was probably 66 that they started developing all of this and really putting it together. And so it was a good couple of years that they developed it and got it ready to uh, put out. But, um, and, and 
like his previous films, his films had been running long. And so he actually was very conscious of the length of this and didn't want it to get longer and longer. And so uh, Sergio Donati, who he had worked with before, he had him come on board to help with the script and kind of help tighten it up and keep it tight, especially as the production was going on. And and Donati is one of the people who really worked on the dialogue. And so a lot of the really snappy dialogue um, came from him. And uh, and I guess he's who we'd think that it's not even longer. <laughs> Because <laughs> it could have been, <laughs> and and there are there are other things that we can uh, be thankful for, like the fact that this didn't turn into Last Tango in the West. Jeez, uh, oh, <laughs> right. I want you to pick up the soap. <laughs> <laughs> could have been a very different movie. All I'm saying, a very could have been right. a very different movie uh, with uh, Bertolucci's uh, Bertolucci's input. Yes, uh, very good. Very much could have been. <laughs> uh, still, it, it, it's it's a, a fantastic just sort of a team uh, of folks who were I- involved in getting this thing done. That the initial treatment word is the initial treatment was, you know, more than three hundred pages. That this was always going to be an epic uh, uh, film. Uh, but you know, you're right. How much more epic could we take? Uh, I guess we'll see. Well, what's interesting about the length is that if you take all the dialogue in this film and you put it all together, it's only about 15 pages of dialogue. (laughs) So that gives you a sense as to how much extra stuff is going on in this film. There's a lot, but I swear this film never bores me. There is such an amazing sense of storytelling style and panache, the way that he does it. I mean, the, the first scene of this film... I, it's one of the most exciting uh, openings of a film that I've ever seen. And it's three guys waiting in a train station for a late train to arrive. But it's done oh. in such a fun way that I just, I, I mean, I'm engrossed and on the edge of my seat the entire time it's happening. Fun and actually technically masterful. Right. Right. The, the yeah. fun stuff, you know, you, you get these guys that these are you get the sense that they're hard, you know, hard boiled. Are, are they hard boiled cowboys? What do you call a cowboy that's effectively hard boiled? I don't think hard boiled is the thing that you say. To the <laughs> I don't cowboys. think you do have hard boiled cowboys. They're hard riding cowboys, right? They're tough yes, guys. There you go. And and uh, and they're all taking their place, right? You can see them sort of scoping this train station, waiting for the train that's two hours late, right? The noon train is two hours late because the West and. Uh, and so they're staking out their places and one of them ends up under a water tank and the the water is dripping on him. And you get the sense that, OK, these guys are tough, hard riding cowboys and they are also goofy and they're incredibly bored. And right. all of that comes out without a single word. But then, Andy, the fly, the fly, <laughs> Andy, is amazing. I I watched this whole movie and I thought, you know what, they actually could have taken that fly sequence and put it as the climax of the movie, and I would be equally satisfied with this film. That was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so much fun, uh, and I love watching that scene. It's it's just so great. The, those those three guys at the beginning of the film are just <laughs> they have so much character. It's so fun to watch that trio of uh, some classic faces. Woody Strode, yep. who is, uh, uh, he is one of the guys who uh, has been in a number of uh, John Ford's films. And so he was very much a guy that uh, that Leone wanted to bring over. And of course, Jack Elam, likewise, was another classic face of the West. We talked about him on High Noon. He was in that yep. one. Absolutely. And you also have Al Mullock as the as the third guy and he's not as familiar as the first two he's a canadian character actor but he is a face that we've seen before because he is the first face that pops up in the good the bad and the ugly i i feel like you left that that fly sequence a little bit too early what i was really hoping for was that you knew how they did that they didn't try to fly i know that and in one sequence when it's on the wood next to him you can kind of see there it's being it's a little tiny fly that's being like a plastic fly that's being dragged along. But that fly right. on his lip, that's a fly, man. That's a fly, yeah. They um, they were trying originally with a fake fly on his face, and, and they just thought it looked way too stupid. Um, oh, it's so it, it, it stupid. Yeah, that it, stupid. Yeah, it would have looked really dumb. <laughs> and so what they did is they actually put some honey on his face, on Jack Elam's uh, face. Of course. And, and the, the fly would not leave him alone. 
And it's so brilliant because he's just sitting there and he's so lazy. All he, He's not swatting it. He's just trying to blow it away and it won't go anywhere. <laughs> Oh, what's so great it's about so that good. is he's super lazy he won't lift his hand but as soon as it gets on the wood he actually lifts his gun as right. if he's going to shoot it which <laughs> is such great punctuation at the end of this sequence that in fact these guys are hard riding toughs in the west who are also really really dumb and <laughs> that they get into an exchange with harmonica uh did you bring me an extra a horse for me? <laughs> Looks like we're one short. No, I think you brought two too many is brilliant. Well, and what's great about that first fight is it shows us that, uh, well, we've got a, an incredible gunfighter with harmonica. But even when he's up against three, he's still not impervious. He gets hit. And it's like, you know, that's that's nice to see that he's not just this perfect cowboy. He's somebody who still is is can get hurt and does. And I thought that was actually a really nice uh, touch to have as a part of that uh, shootout. You know, I have a I have a thought on this and I wonder your take on it. Do you think that he was uh, hit in that opening sequence to tell us a story that uh, he to tell us a story of him and his character in particular or to tell us a story of age that, in fact, like these guys are weathered and maybe had he been in his prime, he would have been able to take out all three guys. That's an interesting point, and I'm sure there's some of that, too. Like, maybe if he had been a little younger and if he had gone to f- confront Frank at an earlier point in his life, that maybe yeah. he would have. Uh, but then maybe he also wasn't as good a shot when he was younger. So right, who knows? right. We don't have yeah. the benefit of this being a lifelong story of vengeance. <laughs> right. Uh, right. We kind of need the lifelong part. Uh, yes. So, yes. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, let's talk just a, a little bit about uh, uh, Henry Fonda, can we? Oh, I, I want to Henry talk Fonda. about the Fond. Um, what an exciting uh, surprise to have in this film. This was a very purposeful choice of Leone's. I mean, he wanted to work with Henry Fonda anyway because it was his favorite actor. But casting him as Frank, the the villain of the film, and not just the villain, but a totally cruel, cruel man who guns down children and is just sadistic in the way that he handles things. It was just an amazing surprise. And the way that he chose to introduce Fonda and that surprise of the reveal, uh, from my understanding, when that happened, and people just gasped because they had no idea that Henry Fonda would ever play such a despicable character. He had always been such wonderful characters like we had seen in um, uh, Young Mr. Lincoln or, uh, you know, some of his earlier films where he was always the protagonist, the Grapes of Wrath. Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, Rounders. Come on. Yeah. And, and, And here he is. You get that shot of this family getting gunned down. And then he and you get this shot from behind him as he's coming up to this little boy and the camera just comes around him and it shows those beautiful blue eyes and reveals, oh, look, it's Henry Fonda and he's the killer here. And yeah. then his his uh, one of his men asks, you know, what do you want to do with him, Frank? Well, now that you said my name and he pulls <laughs> his gun out and guns the kid down. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. Oh. Well, and and that's a great story. There's a wonderful clip of of Fonda telling this story on his casting, and uh, you know that that he hadn't seen the the three original films when he was offered the role, and, uh, and that he called his uh, some of his friends, and one of his actor friends said, "Don't even don't even read the script. It's a Sergio Leone. Just go. You'll you'll have an amazing time. Just go." Uh, and so he he tells a story about how he thought, you know, if I'm going to play this hardened kind of bad guy i'm i i think i'm i'm gonna you know i want to embed myself i want to look the part so he called uh, uh some makeup folks that he knew and he had uh brown contact lenses made so that they could put him in his eyes so that he wouldn't have those beautiful blue eyes uh he grew out a long dark mustache like a longhorn mustache on his face uh and and really looked the part of a western uh, a hard-boiled hard-riding western uh bad guy and he shows up on set the first day and Leone looks at him and says, uh-uh, uh-uh, take it all off. Uh, I want you to shave your face. I need that clean shaven, uh, blue eyed Henry Fonda, because that reveal when when all these guys come emerge from the sagebrush, 
and that camera reverses angle on you, uh, I want people in the audience to say, and Fonda says, he just said, he said he wanted people to say, Jesus Christ, that's Henry Fonda, <laughs> which is exactly what you get. Even 50 years later, that's exactly what you get. He looks great. It's such a fantastic surprise. Yeah. It works so well. And I, I just love seeing him in it. He does a great job as this villain. And the, there's a couple great scenes between him and Charles Bronson, like when when he is well every time that he's with charles bronson really it's it's really interesting because charles bronson is keeping from him who he is and and he doesn't tell him his identity and you get those great conversations where henry fonda is just struggling trying to like who are you and that that always plays really nicely but then there's that fantastic scene where bronson watches he he's looking outside and he realizes that all of frank's men are out there and that they might actually be gunning for Frank, not for him. Mm -hmm. And so he's watching as Frank goes outside and he's keeping an eye on these guys and realizing that they're going to try to kill Frank. And that really interesting exchange where he's actually now helping Frank by killing Frank's men or, or helping Frank kill his own men. What a surprise and what a turn, which leads to a, a, a beautiful exchange that he has with that uh, that harmonica has with jill when she's just like how could you not kill him and he's just like saving you know you know saving his life is different than not letting them kill him which i thought was really interesting and it builds to a, that perfect flashback that we have at the end that reveals and ties everything together for us it's just it's just so beautifully done it really is. And and speaking of Bronson uh, as harmonica, uh, this was uh, this part in particular, what it particularly was uh, originally uh, offered to Eastwood. What I heard is that it was actually the part of the three guys at the train station that were offered to the three guys from uh, his previous films. It would have been Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef, and Eli Wallach as the three guys going to the train station, and then they all get <laughs> killed off in the first 10 minutes. I love that idea, and I think it would have been so great to see that play out. Um, it's a, it's a, I, I don't know if it's just a tall tale or what, but I think everybody likes imagining that that actually happened, and then when they found out that their parts were so small that they all said no, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I hadn't heard that uh, Eastwood was originally slated for the this part, though. It's pretty interesting. It is. It, it is interesting. And uh, but uh, apparently, you know, and this is uh, what do I know? It's coming from Wikipedia. But uh, apparently Leone offered it originally to Eastwood and then went straight to Bronson, um, uh, who uh, who had originally been offered uh, again, according to Wikipedia and whatever this particular source is, uh, originally been offered the part of uh, the man with no name um, yeah, with James Coburn as uh, harmonica, uh, but that they demanded, but he demanded too much money. Well, it's, it's pretty interesting and it would make for an interesting choice. But, you know, Bronson had been in Magnificent Seven. We've yeah. talked about him on the show a number of times. He already feels natural in this world of the Western. And I think that that is something that Leone obviously knew and, and felt like he would be right for. It, this is one of those period castings where, okay, he's playing a Native American, a little hard to buy, but interestingly, it was easier to buy than some other, the uh, you know, castings where you have somebody uh, brought in to be a Native American at the time. Um, I, I think Bronson actually kind of fits a little bit. And it's just one of those things you have to just kind of acknowledge this is the period and this is how they were making these decisions at the time. And then you have Jason Robards playing Manuel Cheyenne Gutierrez. What is Jason Robards <laughs> even playing there? Like, there's way too many different sort of ethnic. Uh, that's an ethnic stew that Robards has inherited in Cheyenne. Although I've never heard him called anything but Cheyenne, Cheyenne in the film. Right, so, so right. those other those other bits are uh, interesting additions to the name that i didn't even know were there which is pretty funny <laughs> right um but oh man robards is just great in this and uh, you know yeah. he's he he wears scruff in such a great way that he just he just feels like he's of this period and uh, that's something that i feel like leone really captured with his casting and and just his his hair and makeup wardrobe team 
finding looks for people that just really fit and made them feel authentic. And I, I love seeing him in the film. It's just, it's great. And he's got some moments, uh, both him and uh, uh, Charles Bronson have some moments with Jill that that you know can be a little tough. But in context of how it all ends up working out, it's like, you know, I, I end up finding it to to play out okay, even if it's like eh, the whole pat on the bottom thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a tough way to end the movie for us. <laughs> it's right. a tough red way to end her role uh, with our our time with her. Um, but really good. And again, back to that uh, back to their introduction uh, in the tavern, which is such a central part. The, the The way that sequence is shot, right? The way Leone uses depth. Uh, of the set and the set is amazing right that tavern which is just full of those uh, amazing posts that uh, the vertical posts and the slats in the uh, in the the walls so that you have the light bleeding in from all kinds of crazy angles against the dust uh, and we end up with this reveal of harmonica off in the corner and this great sequence where uh, Cheyenne lights a lantern and then slides it on a rope, like open flame, <laughs> slides it on a rope. <laughs> Seems remarkably dangerous and thoughtless in this space. But the way they use the light of that of that lantern and, you know, uh, obviously additional lights, but to make it feel like we are actually traveling uh, with that light to reveal, um, you know, Harmonica's eyes under his hat as he's playing that, that theme. It, it's just fantastic. And again, with hardly a word spoken. And speaking of his eyes, man, that uh, that final close up that you get of his eyes uh, during the duel as as yeah. you just push in like beyond any point where you think anyone will ever push in on somebody's eyes. Uh, Leone just goes a little bit farther. He cranks it up to 11 with that uh, that zoom and those eyes of Bronson's just fill the frame. And it's just an amazing, amazing close up that we get. I mean, that's something that Leone does really well is he shoots his landscapes beautifully, but he also understands that the people in his films become part of the landscapes and their faces are landscapes. And the way that he just incorporates these actors, not just, I mean, they're all wonderful actors, but everybody else in the film, just in such amazing ways that they all feel completely authentic to this, uh, this period and this time in this film. He does some interesting things with movement, too. He tends to be fairly restrained around moving the camera without uh, a great intention. You know, it's it's largely uh, a cutting film between great big wide shots, beautiful landscapes. And then we have, you know, medium shots and some some of those incredible close ups. And then when he moves the camera, like, for example, when Jill comes in to the tavern sequence where she is center frame and we're tracking back, you know, as she's walking in and we see every, the, the sort of world over her shoulders. Um, you know, uh, uh, kind of going on, but we're really focused on her face. Cameras moving, and when uh, Cheyenne comes in, uh, we're uh, it's essentially it's it's the same uh, sort of shot, right? He's walking in, but we're uh, on the side now, shooting from I guess the tavern right, uh, and and shooting him uh, sort of trucking along next to him, and. Uh, we get to see him kind of taking in the room and uh, such a wonderful use of, of establishing character and perspective uh, by using the camera to demonstrate sort of, uh, I don't know, wariness. Uh, it, it is a much more confident shot when she, when we're on her uh, and it is a much more sort of uh, unstable shot when we're on him. Uh, and, and I think it's just it's just a really beautifully intuitive way to, to get those characters together. He does that uh, throughout the film, the way that he plays with the camera and the framing and uh, the reveals. Uh, he really loves using his camera moves when it's allowing for an interesting reveal. Like uh, oftentimes when we are when we have uh, harmonica appearing, he's the camera is pretty static and he is stepping into the frame it just mm -hmm. it, like perfectly like one step where he'll step and he and he's in the frame and it's it's wonderful but then you get other characters like when when jill opens her door and we reveal cheyenne where she opens the door 
and it's like it, it's a, a dolly shot that kind of moves around the door and the camera's turning as it's moving forward and it reveals Cheyenne. He loves doing that and and the way that he plays with that to give us those moments where uh, we're presented with something and it's thrust in into view. Um, it's just, it makes, for, it's so exciting. Uh, truly. And, you know, we should mention behind the camera, Tonino Delicoli, uh, who's uh, a cinematographer of this thing, a really fantastic work. It really is. Yeah. he He's uh, worked with Leone uh, before, and this is another uh, feather in the cap for these guys. And I don't think he works on his next film, actually. This might be... Uh, no, it's not their last film together, but I'm pretty sure that they do not work on um, Duck You Sucker. So it's uh, it will be a different team on that one, and then he'll come back for Once Upon a Time in America. We should say, you know, and I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but the, the score uh, is by the wonderful Ennio Morricone. And I, I bring up Ennio Morricone now because, first of all, the score is fantastic. It, it's it's really wonderful. Um and the the word is, as I understand it, that, uh, you know, uh, Sergio went to uh, Morricone and said, hey, you know, here's what we're doing. And before they started shooting, Morricone had come back with the themes for the three major characters and uh, and uh, some additional music. And then uh, while they were on set, as a result, um, f- for major sequences, uh, Leone was actually, you know, playing the score as his actors were, you know, doing their stuff. Uh, As a result, many of the sequences are beautifully timed exactly to the beat, to the music. And it really does change the way you experience these sequences. This this crane shot that reveals the town of Flagstone is one of those sequences where we see Jill and she comes. She's she's exterior. She walks into the the, uh, cameras parallel to her and we're uh, we're next to her. She goes inside the, the station house and then we crane up over the roof of the station and we reveal the 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 town uh, all to the the orchestrations behind us and it it's just a beautiful and emotional sequence and i i love that i love just knowing that because it it reminds me where um you know movies like baby driver come from right baby driver which is sort of renowned for doing exactly that for having uh you know for having um, uh, little buds in the actor's ears listening to the soundtrack of the movie that or of the of the music that would be playing behind their scene uh, you know, so that he, they could get all the timing right. I mean, this is where that comes from. Morricone obviously has a great working relationship with Leone. And they, uh, I think at this point, um, they have really kind of defined a great a way to kind of tell these stories. And by creating these themes and, and allowing for Leone to have the music to play on set, I think it was just a really great thing uh, for them to to have at this point. And as we already know, Pete, he had to get to work right away on the Danger <laughs> Diabolic score. <laughs> That's why he had to get this one done so quickly. <laughs> God, that was so dumb. Oh, deep, deep down, oh. dumb. Oh, deep, 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 deep dumb. down, baby. No, it's good stuff. <laughs> it's nowhere as good as this music. This is really kind of that iconic Hollywood scoring where you had very distinct themes, these beautiful themes for each of the the principal characters. All four of them get a great theme. And what's great about that is as they come together, the themes work well in counterpoint and even sometimes blending together, especially when it's harmonica. His theme sometimes will lay over Frank's theme so perfectly as they're kind of coming into conflict. It's nice, and it it defines, I think, a uh, one of the just fantastically um, perfect classic Western scores. Yes. Now, before we go on, we we have to talk about this one very strange sequence that I I don't know how to talk about this. I'm hoping that you, as the expert, uh, do. 
So how's that for a setup? <laughs> a, you're that a is, bastard for so giving bar, me that as my the, setup. <laughs> the bar is very high. I just want you to know the bar is very high. But as a result of your expertise, you will be a hero in this conversation. Here we go. It's the sequence where we have uh, Fonda. It's a, the, the scene starts out and it looks like they're, uh, I guess they're standing up, but they're not because the camera turns uh, and suddenly we realize they're laying down on that funky swinging bed. Uh, please take it away, Maestro. What are they doing there? It's this is something that uh, uh, you're 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 a terrible help <laughs> setting me up that way. Uh, I am very curious what that type of camera lens is, where you actually uh, the camera itself doesn't have to move, but the lens you turn the lens and it will shift the image from kind of vertical to horizontal or vice versa. And the way that that lens um, does that here, it's it's something that I feel like I, I honestly can't remember, but I, I feel like I haven't seen that prior to this film, like in a, in a pre-1968 film. So I'm wondering where that technology actually began, where you actually had that as a lens that mounted on your camera yeah. that you could just turn it and it would it would do that shift for you without you having to actually have the entire camera on kind of a crane arm that was kind of moving the entire unit. Um, so a, very interesting, but it is an interesting moment in that scene, mainly because it's a bed hanging on chains in a cave. Yeah, that was very strange. <laughs> very strange. A uh, uh, little setup there, um, Henry. Uh, anyhow, beautiful uh, work, puzzling setup. Now, I know you're very excited about this because this was shot once again right outside your home. Uh, yes, indeed. Good old Monument Valley, as we've said. Fantastic place um, up in uh, the, the corner of the state, right near the Four Corners, kind of bordering Utah and Arizona. But it's it's awfully close to Colorado and New Mexico as well. Uh, it's just a fantastically beautiful place. And as I said earlier, everybody really should take a trip there and stay there. Are some amazing uh, cabins and hotel rooms that are like right there facing it. So you just you stay there and your windows all face the amazing beauty. Um, so it's it's a, it's a spectacular place and everybody needs to check it out. Um, but they filmed there. They also, uh, as we were just talking about his strange cave bed, it actually was in Mesa Verde, which is over in Colorado, uh, one of the national parks there with the uh, really interesting Indian cliff dwellings that are kind of up there. And it's, it's interesting to see them filming there. Um, and that was the scene where where uh, he sends Morton back to their uh, little hideout, I guess it is, where they're up in this place. Um, and then, uh, then, as per most spaghetti westerns, they filmed it around Andalusia in Spain. Which is lovely. It has the desert look. It doesn't have the red dirt. And actually, they had to import some of the red earth from the Monument Valley area so that when, um, when Cheyenne's men come into that, that rundown bar, uh, and the door opens and all the dust blows in. They, that's the red dust that they imported from Monument Valley because all the dust in Andalusia is all much more uh, brownish yellow. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I want to be the prop master for the movie like this. Right. <laughs> There's my dirt. There's my dirt. Uh, well, it was it's lovely. And then they did, uh, yeah, Andalusia, a little bit of or the the studio was uh, sin. sin Sin Chinichita. 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 Mwah. <laughs> Mwah. In uh, in Rome. Um uh, how did it do it? Did it do well in award season? My understanding was that the movie uh it, it had kind of a silent uh silent release. This it's a genre film and I I think that genre films uh especially at this point for westerns uh, they may not have been taken as seriously. And so uh, this was one of those where it, I don't think it was something that was taken too seriously. Um, although around the uh, different parts of the world, like in Italy, the Italian National Syndicate of Film Journalists nominated uh, Gabriele uh, Ferzetti as Best Supporting Actor and Ania Morricone as uh, Best Composer. Um, Gabriele Ferzetti, who was that? Oh, that, of course, was Morton. Uh, so those were the two that got the nominations for the Silver Ribbon. Mm -hmm. um, neither of them won. In uh, also the David Di Donatello Awards, it was nominated for Best Production and for Bino uh, Chicogna uh, for 
<laughs> I don't know if I'm saying that name right <laughs> at all. Bino Chicona, uh, who was the producer on the film and the film uh, tied it won tying with the girl with a pistol. So those are the two um, awards that it did get. But it did get other awards as it's kind of go- grown through the years. Uh, and the National Film Registry, it was preserved in 2009. It's gotten a few awards for the DVD releases, uh, things like that. So again, it's uh, and then the Laurel Awards, actually, the Golden Laurel Awards. Uh, Charles Bronson was nominated for uh, for Best Male Supporting Performance. Now, what about the box office, Andy? How did it do in the box office? When Paramount offered Leone $5 million, or $34.6 million in today's dollars, plus access to Henry Fonda, as I said, he gave up his idea of not making any more westerns and jumped wholeheartedly into this one. The movie was released in Italy on December 21st, 1968, and hit the States on May 28th, 1969, opposite the Jack Lemmon Catherine Deneuve rom-com, The April Fools. The movie kinda came and went in the States, only making $5.3 million at the box office. That being said, it was a huge hit in France. It was the most successful film there in 1969, with 14.8 million admissions, ranking seventh of all time. Wow. It was also the most popular film in Germany that year, with admissions of 13 million, ranking third of all time. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any actual budget figures that reflected all of that. All I found was a source that said it made 55,000 in international markets. That gives it a total gross in today's dollars of $37.2 million and leaves it with an adjusted profit per finish minute of 15800 It sounds like it did much better than this, but that's all I could find. Still, it was a box office win for Leone and is now considered a classic Western. That it is. The number of times you, you read, uh, you know, uh, critics and students of film talk about this movie and not end their conversation on this movie with, I think this is the best Western ever made. It's slim. It's slim. People think very highly of this movie. They do. It's true. It's uh, and a lot of people will say of all the Westerns that Leone did, of all the films that Leone did, that this is the best. Um, I think it is certainly a, one of uh, my favorites. And I have just a fantastic time every time I put it on. Well, let me tell you, I thought it was pretty good uh, when we were talking about the other three movies and I thought I'd seen it. I thought it was pretty good. (laughs) Now that I've actually seen it, (laughs) I think, let's just say this flick chart, it's in the bag. Shall we? Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all the movies we've ever talked about. Uh, uh, But if you swipe over in your show notes and you tap the word flick chart there, it should take you straight to this film where you can add it to your list and see if it does as well as it's going to on ours. Here we go. All right. First up, Once Upon a Time in the West or The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Once Upon a Time in the West. I didn't even need to tell you which dragon tattoo that was. Doesn't matter. Once Upon a Time in the West or Fargo. Once Upon a Time in the West. Wow. What do you think really? about this? Yeah. No, I'm laying it down. I, I'm a little surprised. I I don't know where this falls on my chart. And I'm a little all of a sudden surprised and, and nervous about picking. <laughs> <because> <laughs> you're so excited. Oh, my well, goodness. Well, I'm very excited. And I know I recognize that this is first time excitement. Like, I, maybe it'll it'll change. But right now, I'm not going to lie to you, Andy. It, this film performed exceptionally well on my own list. It is a really good film. I am. Uh, I'm going to go with it over Fargo. I don't know if I uh, will agree with that in the morning, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> Once Upon a Time in the West or Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Oh, crap. Here I will, will say Pilgrim. Once Upon a Time yeah. in the West. Really? I was going to. I said Scott Pilgrim. No, I'll say once upon a time in the West. All right, I'll give it to you. Look at me. Look oh, at you. Andy, you we, we only have one. tonight. There is no tomorrow. <laughs> once upon a time in the West. Or Children of Men. Once upon a time in the West. Yeah, I'll say once upon a time in the West. <gasps> once upon a time in the West or Groundhog Day. It's Groundhog Day for me. And it's once upon a time in the West for me. No. Oh, whoa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Here we go. All right. One. One two. two three. three. Rock. Scissors. <gasps> oh, oh, Andy. And Korg takes it. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time in the West or seven. It's seven. Oh, it's me. seven. Once upon a time in the West or Serenity. Uh, it's uh, Once upon a time in the West. 
Once Upon a Time in the West. Wow. I thought for sure you were going to say Serenity. I know. Once Upon a Time in the West or E.T., the extraterrestrial. I'm going with E.T. <laughs> All right. You can have E.T. I don't, I don't <laughs> actually stand by that, uh, uh, but I, it's fine. It's a cultural win. It's, uh, you know what? This still landed in our top 10. <gasps> really? That's, I think, telling of the success of the film. Uh, yes, it is at number eight on our flick chart out of 376 films. That's a, wow. a pretty stellar step up for this film. And, you know, I, I don't have a problem with it being so high because I uh, do think it's a brilliant film. When's the last time we had something crack the top 10? A new film crack the top 10? It's been a while, right? Yeah, E.T. was um, early last year in her Melissa Matheson series. Right, right. Nope, good. That's a good point. And T2 is actually the year before. Okay. All right. So E.T. was the newest one and it didn't break through E.T. But still, yeah. um, last year, it's been a yeah. while. It's hard it's, to crack it, it, that vaunted top 10, Andy. We've had, it's generally been about uh, one a year. <laughs> what I <laughs> really can't in. believe is that this movie actually bumped Jaws out of the top 10. What is that about? What That's is a disappointment that about? for me. <gasps> I think it is me too. It, it's getting dangerously close to a complete re-ranking episode. Dangerously close. I think it close. is. I think it is. <laughs> 2001 needs it, Pete. <laughs> we have to we have to right some wrongs and hopefully not some not wrong some rights. <laughs> indeed, indeed. How this oh, do on your uh, personal chart? Do you have it up? This film landed at 231 on my personal chart. Uh 231 out of 4056 films. So that's about a 94%. It's way up there for me. 94%. So you're going to you're going to be crowing about your 94. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was crowing, but feel free to crow right it now. It sounded like you were crowing. This landed at 17 on my list out of 1,044 movies. That's a 98%. Uh, and if I were to go Woo. by the algorithm uh, for this film at letterbox.com slash the next reel, that would be a five-star movie. And I'm going to give it a five stars, and I'm going to give it a heart. From the first time I watched it to this most recent watching, uh, it has always been a five star with a heart. This is just, I think, one of the top uh, Westerns and just one of the great films that uh, that everybody needs to see. I need to call my father because apparently he didn't do his job and make me watch this movie <laughs> when I should have. And we were wasting time on other lesser films for sure. So uh, yes. this has been and a now real you treat. need to show your kids. I can't wait. Actually... <laughs> Actually, here's a here's an excellent observation. So uh, my daughter uh, was uh, lying to herself about the uh, breadth of her own homework uh, over the weekend. And so she sat down next to me while I was watching this movie. And her the only time she never left. Right. She wouldn't leave to watch something else uh, until her mother got home and said, so uh, how you doing on your work? And she got very upset. And as she was leaving the couch, she sort of stood up and left her eyes on the screen. And the one thing she said after watching for like an hour and 20 minutes or so, I mean, she was there a long time. She said, why is everybody so old? <laughs> <laughs> astute, oh, youth. Astute viewing. Uh, and, uh, you know, so now she's got to finish it and then she can learn why they're so old. Well, you know, everybody in this film was probably in their 20s. Exactly. It's the Old West. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Uh, so this, uh, this makes the first of the three movies, uh, in this little series. What is the, what's the next one all about? The next one is Duck You Sucker, which, um, is also officially in Italian. It's called Giulia Testa, which means keep your head down. Um, but in America it was Duck You Sucker and that didn't play very well. So they changed really? the title to A Fistful of Dynamite. Yeah. You wonder why. <laughs> And I guess in, in France, it was released as Once Upon a Time, The Revolution, which um, really is the title that uh, kind of connected it to this trilogy. This is the uh, the next film that Leone did, came out in 1971, and it is the film that we're going to be talking about next week. And you know, one of the things we didn't talk about as we were talking about this very film was the difference between the original theatrical U.S. cut uh and the uh re-released cut that that both of us watched uh, of this movie and my understanding right. is now that i know i've never seen the original uh that the original was just nonsensical uh and and that this is the only version you really need to watch 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's nonsensical. They only cut about 20 minutes, but still, it's it's key scenes. Like, the, the whole scene where you meet Cheyenne in that trading post that you love so much, that was released. And and, and the way what? it's set up now is what? you don't meet him. Yeah, I know. And now it's set up where you don't meet him until he arrives at the McMaid Ranch to to talk to Jill. Um, you, um, let's see what nonsense. else was cut. That ah, is I, I know. just... The uh, whole scene that we talked about with with um, uh, oh, Frank and Morton up at the uh, the cliffs in in Mesa Verde that was gone. Um, when Morton died, that was shortened, and the whole thing of Cheyenne dying was excised. What? The last thing you see is the two of them leave Jill's house and ride off, and that's it. It's it's crazy that they cut those scenes. Well, that's terrible. All right. Well, the yeah. whole point of me even bringing that up is, do I need to be concerned about any of that uh, uh, that trouble uh, in watching Ducky Sucker? That is certainly one that's uh, also had its share of um, releases and and edits and all sorts of issues. If you watch the the most recent edition that uh, was released and restored, I believe uh, probably about um, fifteen years ago or so. It is about 154 minutes, and it's pretty much as close as you're going to get to the complete version of the film. Um, and so that's uh, that's probably the one to make sure you're checking out. Now, now, the version I have here is a fistful of dynamite, and it's two hours and 36 minutes. And uh, I, that is the, the uh, iTunes version that I have access to here. That should be right, yeah, because it's, it's right around that 150-some mark outstanding i'm curious now as as you watch it if the title is going to show duck you sucker or a fistful of dynamite i'm guessing it'll say fistful of dynamites if well, that's what it's uh, right that's as. that's what i think is it's actually really fascinating that uh, i'm sitting here looking at the art and it it has no mention of uh duck you sucker until you read the uh the uh, uh, brief about the movie where it, it actually says you know sean's pre-dynamiting cry is duck you sucker and that's it. Well, we'll talk a lot more about the titles and everything else with that film on our show next week. I can't wait. Well, if you want to hear more of us, but you can't wait until next week's show, you can support us over on patreon.com slash the next reel and get access to our exclusive members only weekend show, the Saturday matinee. You might not know it because Andy's uh, not on that show anymore, but uh, sometimes <laughs> oh, he shows up. Ouch. And when he does, we talk about movie news and new trailers and we go head to head. Some of us go head to head in our weekly challenge in which we put together lists of movies related in some way to the movie we're discussing this week. And when I don't participate, I, I still make it known when I'm disappointed you in sure the choices do. that you guys you make. You sure do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, but there are all sorts of other goodies, too. If you support us at different levels, just head over to patreon.com slash the next reel. You can learn more about us and check out the detailed show notes at the next reel.com. You can subscribe for free in your favorite podcast app and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at the next reel. And if you want to get into the conversation yourself, join our Discord channel for a whole lot of movie chat with movie lovers from around the world. You can find the link to join in the show notes or on the website. The next reel couldn't happen without the hard work of Stephen Smart running Instagram. Ben Lott, who runs all things Twitter. And thanks to Eli Catlin, who graciously allows us to use his song, Ragtime Instrumental, as the theme to the show. You can find out more about Eli on his SoundCloud page. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. People, uh, people don't. People, people don't say nice things. Well, at least most people like the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's, but the uh, ones who true. don't really don't. Uh, they don't, and and I uh, once again, it, the the overwhelming response is from people who don't like the movie. Mostly, they just don't have patience for the movie, and they enjoy saying mean things. That's very true. So it's the internet. I uh, is, I, yeah. I don't know. Would you uh, Would you like to go first? Would you like me to go first? How are you feeling tonight? Yeah, I'll take it. All right. Uh, I have a one star by Michael Rabikowski, who watched on VHS back in 2000 and said, this film is a waste of money. It is so slow. You can see Moss grow on the actors.
it should be called Faces. <laughs> if you can stand to watch the whole laborious thing, you will know every pore in the face of the major actors. I bought this poor excuse for anything from Amazon. I don't get what that last <laughs> thing means. I don't either. That is a good <laughs> representation of a large number of reviews, negative reviews, is that <laughs> it was very, very slow. Uh, this one is and 12 people found it helpful 12 yes yes oh I forgot I need to get ready to mark mine as helpful uh, this one says uh, JS who writes that western myth- mythology is right it's total bull I, I don't I don't get that oh my. Uh, idiotic says either. JS apart from being appallingly sexist normal behavior was blatantly discourteous a person can't just ask for a drink of water without asserting manliness by tearing someone's clothes also, I guess Sergio Leone was a relic of a futile system. Also, in this context, the Magnificent Seven, based on the Seven Samurai, where peasants and serfs typically weren't armed and were accustomed to being rampaged over by their betters. But the settlers who commandeered the American West were all armed. They had to be. It's unimaginable that townspeople would have scuttled about with their heads down if armed strangers came to town and started climbing all over their storefronts. There would have been some per- some pertinent questions asked, is my guess, and the good citizens may not have spent much time doing that, especially after the murder of a family. There would have been some vigi- vigilante action and a few hangings, which would have shortened this movie considerably. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand how this could be considered an American classic i love that i was waiting for that option that uh opportunity to shorten it right right (laughs) could we just hang some more people to cut off an hour (laughs) Uh, uh, i'm going to mark this as helpful (laughs) what a what a ridiculous tool that they have built into amazon reviews this helpful (laughs) unhelpful nonsense this is this is not helpful but i will use it (laughs) thank you amazon it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations. But it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we've covered, from Season 1 up through our current season. For part of Season 8, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. (sighs) Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. (laughs) Wait, wait, no, that's not what I... (sighs) Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective, the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been weird. Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! (laughs) Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Reel family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. (laughs) 